Hi everyone, welcome to the end of 2020. Oh my days, we made it. It's the end of the year and the start of what hopefully will be an amazing 2021 for all of you guys. Um, what have we got for you? Well, we have our annual clip show. It's massive. It's one and a half hours of all the bits that didn't quite fit in the edits of this year's No Such Thing as a Fish. I really hope you like it. These are always my favorite episodes because they go from one thing to another to another. You never know what you're going to get, but you do know that there'll always be something interesting or something a bit silly. Okay, well, what else is there to say? I suppose uh, our book, Funny You Should Ask, is still available in all shops if you got book tokens. Do people still get book tokens? Well, anyway, it's it's in the shops. Funny you should ask by the QI Elves. And also, next year, we hope, will be a big year of touring for us. As soon as the venues open, we will be back out there to do our thing, meet all you guys. So keep an eye on no such things as fish.com for any details about that. And I believe there is one show that is currently on sale that will be in London in the spring. So get tickets for that, get our book, enjoy the show, and we'll see you on the other side. Happy New Year! On with the podcast. Hey guys, I've got a quick quiz question. Oh, yeah. If the date is Wednesday the 31st of December, mm. are you in the last week of the year? Uh, yes. 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 That is incorrect. You're in the first week of the year. So I'm annoying. afraid you all have to leave. What? Can you not be in both? No, of course you can't be in both. What do you mean? It's, it's Wednesday the 31st of December. You're in the last No, week. but the week's different, isn't it? Because it's, it's yeah. more heavy set on the other side of the week in days. If it, it was is. on a scale, it would weigh over to the, <laughs> the New Year week, wouldn't it? Dan's describing better what the International Organization for Standardization describes in terms of how to refer to weeks. So, you know, across the world, we have to have the same de- definition of week one, week two, week three of a year. Do and we- the week... <laughs> We, yeah. we I gotta say, that. I'm with Andy on this one. Look, the week, weeks have to start on a Monday, and we've got to have the same week so that trading and business internationally, globally works. So there's an international body that decides what week one is, and the definition of week one of the year is the week with the year's first Thursday in it. So if the 1st of January is a Thursday, then week one actually starts on the 29th of December, which is that Monday, mm. right? So week one is that. So if the 31st of December is on a Wednesday then you're actually in week one of the next year. because No, that's January insane. Is you day. can't have week one beginning two days before the year ends. I'm sorry. It's absolutely mad. No one does things in weeks anyway. You do things in quarters. No. Or <laughs> when it happens just... like that, Anna always has her New Year's party on Sunday the 28th of December, <laughs> don't you? I do, and it's an absolutely banging event with um, me, me and my cat in attendance. I'm sorry you guys have never been able to make it. Uh, just very quickly, what number Archbishop of Paris do you reckon André Van is, <laughs> is, is, is he the current? The 20, the 23rd? 22nd. As far as I can tell, he's the 30th. Wow. Um, so that's his actual name, André Vantois. Oh. And he, mm-hmm. yeah, he was born with the surname 23. And the, the best guess is that it was because a uh, sort of ancestor of his was found and adopted and they were found on the 23rd of a month and so they were given okay. that surname yeah so but as far as i can tell he's the 30th there's there's a lot of breaks in their archbishops over the years uh so there might be a few that are not in there hey what's <laughs> archbishop vantois favorite band i don't know andy what no. is archbishop vantois favorite band eiffel 65 and it's because they have a french name and then a number uh, oh really? What? Well, well, I feel. I feel. Yeah. No, no, I, I so do understand yeah. that. Yeah, and he's French, uh, and he right. has a number in his name. God. Do you know what their favorite punk band is? No, I don't know. It's Blink One Eighty Two, <laughs> and that's because French people blink like the rest of us, and there's a there's a number following that. I really think we should move this on. I I've got to get out of here. What is Archbishop <laughs> no. Antoine's favorite album by Adele? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, there's a few options there. 20. <laughs> 21, because 21. he's called 23 and it's just another number. Yeah. Yes. But interesting, he prefers it to the original 19. Which, you know, had it's closer, sort of isn't it? Closer to him. Yeah. 
<laughs> are all of Adele's albums numbered? Yeah. Oh, mate. Yes. Yeah, nineteen. That is the age she was when. Actually, when it's actually she... not the ages anymore. They've become untethered from her age. But yeah, got still... it. I thought I was thinking she can't have released twenty three albums or twenty one <laughs> albums this early on in her career. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Um, there's an Indian loser. Uh, called Shiva Keshavan, <laughs> and he has been a true victim of the Indian government's low prioritizing of uh, various Olympic sports. He is. He... You, can, you can understand why the Indian government isn't prioritizing <laughs> prioritizing the luge. Look, to no. Be fair to them. <laughs> Think about the Himalayas. Think about the primo uh, territory yeah. you've got for luging. I was yeah. just thinking but, that Sean yeah. Connery would be a good luge um, manager, like coach, because he'd be like, "You're a luger. You're a luger." <laughs> 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 and all the SHs, Sean Connery's both got Shiva Keshavan. You're a loser. <laughs> um, but so he had to train on wheels, uh, not in a proper luge mm. thing, because uh, that's normally on ice, isn't it, the luge? Yeah. Mm. He had to make a, a sled, basically, with wheels on and just train on busy roads. Oh, wow. Just going downhill in the Himalayas. And he had there's there's footage of him dodging a herd of goats, which is in the middle of the road. <laughs> and he wow. has to sort of frantically luge around. You know, um, Old MacDonald had a farm. Did Very you, well. Did you know yeah. that? Familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. E I E I O. Well, the earliest version we have was actually Old MacDougall had a farm. E I E I O. Ooh. And there's an even earlier version, which is not about um, a farm, but it's Old Missouri had a mule. He hi, <laughs> he hi, ho. Uh, and every country around the world has its own version of um, Old MacDonald. And they're all on Wikipedia, of course. So um, in Turkish, it's Alibaba has a farm, E-I-E-I-O. Cool. In uh. Swedish, it's Per Olsen has a farm, E-I-E-I-O. Uh, and in Serbian, it's Svako Jutro Jedno Jaje Organismus Nagudaje, which means <laughs> one egg a day gives the strength to human organism. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> They've just gone completely <laughs> random. I don't understand that at all. Every other wow. country in the world, it's about someone having a farm. And they're just like, nope, <laughs> eat your eggs. When planes are actually just coming into land as a normal procedure, the way it works is that they have to get ready miles before they even see where the airport is. They've got to get to a certain height. And then there's a couple of things that they have to either see. They've got to either have eyes on the runway or the lights that they can see coming from it to know that they're at the right height. And it's actually the computer on board the airline that makes them make a snap decision about whether or not they're able to land or if they're at the wrong bit. So as they're getting ready to that moment, the computer will just yell out in the cockpit, decide. That's, that's all they get. Just goes, what? decide. And then they go, yes, we're doing it. Or they have to pull out. Wow. Sounds like a TV quiz show. <laughs> and now it's time to decide. <laughs> Oh, you wouldn't want a speedboat, but you've died in a blink. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Do they get warning? Is there a sort of, I'm going to have to have to hurry you here? Yeah. Your time's going to I think, I uh, hope you've made up your mind because in a minute you're going to have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> and then if they go for it, it goes, ooh, interesting oh, decision. No, no. <laughs> well, well, we'll come back after the break to see if you've made the right call. <laughs> Um, there is a problem with being in the center of America, someone found out. There's this massive problem that was generated uh, for someone who lives quite near the center of the US, in fact. And this is to do with a company called MaxMind. Have you read about this story, no. about IP addresses? Okay, so no. it's so weird. Basically, uh, MaxMind is this company who about sort of just over 10 years ago started calculating the location of loads of IP addresses. So, you know, with your computer, you've got an IP mm. address. MaxMind figured out whereabouts they all were geographically, and then it could sell that information to companies like Google and Facebook and lots of other people. Um, but often, when you're trying to work out where an IP address is, you can't get it exact. And sometimes it'll just say, this is somewhere in America or mm, somewhere yeah. in the US. And so for all of those, MaxMind just default assumed that they were in the middle. So they got the coordinates of roughly the middle of America and said, OK, all the IP addresses that we can't quite place, they just are here. And it turns out here is a rural farmhouse belonging to someone called Joyce Taylor, who now has 600 million IP addresses registered <laughs> to her farmhouse. 
And it's so it's a complete disaster because basically if there's a troll online or if there's someone who's hacked your company or if there's uh, someone doing criminal activity online and the police are tracking them down, they chase up their IP address and they constantly find it's at Joyce Taylor's farmhouse. And she's just inundated with kind of abuse and people writing her threatening letters and had no idea why. For about eight years, she was just like, why am I being... Oh, no. What's happening to me? Wow. Are we definitely, Until this journalist tracked her down. Are we definitely discounting the fact that Joyce is like a massive cyber criminal is that <laughs> she's she's a criminal mastermind an 82 year old criminal mastermind it's possible <gasps> that's it's possible. funny oh poor joyce <laughs> poor joyce and apparently that Vern scholars refer to the novel as around the world in 80 days and the play as around the world in 80 days but with 80 the digits oh. so that's how you can tell the difference i'll be honest i didn't get that from when you were reading it out <laughs> I saw the fatal flaw in transferring <laughs> this visual thing in front of me to the audio we're medium. Really, we were really hoping you were going to say around the world in 80 plays was what <laughs> they called the play. He wasn't that smart a guy, you know? People, <laughs> people claim he was. You know, well, I, um, you know mitten crabs is if you catch one, is there always a string attached to another <laughs> mitten crab on the other end? <laughs> uh, the CIA, they collected a load of jokes in the Soviet Union. In the 80s, that was one of the things they did and that got declassified quite recently. Really? Um, we're not quite sure why they did it, but it might have been a way to kind of gauge what people were thinking in the Soviet Union or uh, maybe a way of undermining the government or stuff. So they found stuff like um, there are two men waiting in a line to buy vodka. The first man says, I've had enough. Save my place. I'm going to shoot Gorbachev. Two hours later, he returns to claim his place in the line. His friend said, did you get him? And the man replies, no, the line there was even longer than the line here. That's yeah. a good joke. It's not bad. Yeah. Is it? A man goes into joke. a shop. A man goes into a shop and says, "You don't have any meat, do you?" Um, no, replies the sales lady. We don't have any fish. It's a store across the street that doesn't have any meat. Again, Again. <laughs> that's good. It works, doesn't it? I think that's really good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did they, were they planning on distributing the big book of CIA jokes <laughs> about your country? <laughs> Feels like it, doesn't it? My favourite person to have sort of an Olympic career, career and then a follow up is a guy called uh, Ross Rebagliati. He was the first person ever to win gold at the Winter Olympics in snowboarding, which was in 1998. And it was really sad for him because he won gold and then he was drugs tested and they found cannabis in his system. And so he was immediately had his gold rescinded. He was put in jail for maybe importing it into Japan, I think, which is where the Olympics were. And then within about 72 hours, they then gave the gold medal back because they went, actually, cannabis is not on our list of banned substances, as it wasn't huh. back then. Um, but he insisted that it was from secondhand smoke. Uh, you know, he hadn't smoked weed for almost a year and it was nothing to do with him. He was furious. But... He has now gone on to found a company called Legacy Brands, a CBD and cannabis consumables company, and has a series of different strains of weed named after him. So that's that's his job now. And since he wasn't stoned then, but is stoned all the time now. Yeah. I guess you can never guess what's going to happen, can you? Because the the, uh, the the 1984 Olympics uh, promotion by McDonald's about uh, you could get a free item off the menu every time the US team got on the podium. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know what you got, Big Mac for gold or something, fries for silver mm. or something. Um, they didn't expect the Soviet Union to drop out of the Olympics. So the, the, <laughs> the bloody American national anthem was playing all the time. Uh, and uh, there was, I think there was even a shortage of hamburger buns uh, because uh, people got so many. So you've got to be careful what you uh, what you offer up, I think. Yeah, at any Olympics, saying that about Team USA yeah. is not yeah. quite cool. No, no. no, you're right. <laughs> You want to make it Team Togo. Just be super cautious. Yeah, well, I think so, the, yeah. the Danish basketball team. I think you're going to yeah. make it quite niche and specific. Jamaica Winter Olympics. Yeah. They had one year where it looked a bit dodgy. <laughs> Might have lost a few burgers, but otherwise, you're safe. One more thing. Um, just that you can buy... So I think you were talking at the start about how um, audio stuff can also maybe trigger mm. um, weird hallucinations or change your brain makeup. And actually... They have now invented headphones, which I think are either on the market now or they're coming onto the market soon, which send electrical impulses into your brain and they cause it to release more uh, like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin, like happiness hormones, essentially. And they're called, I think they're called Nirvana headphones. So they stimulate the vagus nerve in your brain, apparently, which then releases all those neurotransmitters and they'll do it in time to the beat of the music you're listening to. So you could even be listening to The Verve or something, but you'd be... <laughs> 
Over the moon? <laughs> oh, unnecessary burn on the verb. Hey, I love the verb, but they're not upbeat. <laughs> yeah, but I've heard that they've tried that, but the drugs don't work, so it's... <laughs> hey! <laughs> Yeah. There was wasn't there a big clash in East Berlin about uh, updating the traffic light men, because really that yeah the the East had particular traffic light men and they were called Ampelmenchen I think which is th- th- literally means exactly that the traffic light men and one of the things that was proposed is replacing all of them and people in East Berlin particularly said no we really we really like these particular traffic sites it's sort of a something mm. very recognizable very iconic about this half of the city and so those i think were rolled out and in fact this is not useful for anyone at home but we have one in a, a jar just here oh that's what this is a build up for <laughs> <laughs> right okay let's see it can we see it okay yeah yeah it's here so this is a little tin of tea this oh, is the oh i recognize that man. yeah yeah and you'll recognize the stop and the go you know what his yeah, yeah. The, the go man looks a bit like an old monopoly man kind of thing because that does a bit yeah. Yeah. yeah we've all seen lots of these right these are these are in berlin well it's a big souvenir thing in berlin now yeah yeah but, but also, also on the, on the traffic lights is the noticeable thing exactly <laughs> where you see a traffic light go and you're like i mean there are yeah. the souvenirs but they're all they the were, well, they lights. were kept. That's the that's sort of the point. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really cool. They're much more jaunty. Mm. Um, I just not sure that show and tell is ever going to work as a podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> it worked when you had your own toy. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> the American Dairy Association has a page on its website called "Famous Cows of the World." And it's a good read. There are a whole bunch of cows on there, but my favorite was Elm Farm Ollie. Do you guys know about Elm Farm Ollie? Nope. No. Well, neither did I, but it was the first cow to fly and also the first, uh, when I say fly, I should be uh-huh. clear, the first clown to ride in an aeroplane. <laughs> clown? And- clown? <laughs> so it was a clown as well as a cow. It's a clown cow? It must have had massive shoes. <laughs> had, a red- had a red nose and huge shoes. I've lost it. It was the first cow to take a flight and it was the first cow to be milked mid-flight uh, this Whoa. was in Missouri in 1930. And it, you know how all these things have some kind of spurious scientific justification? Mm. Yeah. And so the justification for this, when they paid huge amounts of money to take it up, was they wanted to observe the mid-air and high-altitude effect on animals in flight of their milking and of their milk. Okay. And it turns out it didn't make a difference to the milk. But, oh, there was a farmer called Bunce, Ellsworth Bunce, who milked her, who then also became the first person to milk a cow mid-flight. So Ooh. a huge sequence of firsts for Elm Farm Ollie. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be the one who's milking Elm Farm Ollie because um, if, you, if she asks you to smell her flower, it's always going to be milk that squirts out of it into your mouth. Okay. Let's just... <laughs> Dan, do you want to try a better punchline to that punchline? Yeah, I'd like to see you try, Dan. <laughs> no, the master has spoken. So I can't possibly tell that. Has Wonky shut down now? It has, in China? Yeah. yeah, it has. Yeah. Has it? Yeah, yeah. What? No, it had new management a few years ago. I've definitely had it in the last year. I can guarantee they don't do that kind of rude service anymore. They don't do the rude service. Uh, all their TripAdvisor reviews went downhill slightly after they stopped being rude to the customers because <laughs> that was part of the experience. They're like, three stars. The guy was really nice to me who gave me my meal. It was amazing. I went there once and we sat down on the table. It was me and three other people. And then halfway through the meal, literally halfway through the meal, we went, oh, we need this table now. You need to go upstairs. And they took all of our stuff <laughs> and made us sit on a much smaller table upstairs while they put other people on our table. Wow. I had a meal there with Tom Davis, who is, oh, yeah. uh, people will know him on TV as King Gary and a few other TV shows. And we went there and they put us on a big round table where there was an entire family sitting <laughs> and we had an old grandmother sitting in between us. We weren't even next to each other on the table. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. Great days, wonkies. Anyway, our podcast. Yeah, back to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know about the Devonish Fibs family? No. No. Well, they're an uh, extremely prominent family, in a sense, in that their names are all over park benches across the UK. And so this started to be spotted about 10 years ago, maybe a bit more. And there are sort of park benches with, you know, those plaques on in yeah. memory mm. of. And they're always in memory of someone, Devonish Fibs. So, for instance, in Dartmouth oh. Park, near where I used to live, there's one that was in memory of Winter Devonish Fibs. And it said, like to have everything just so. 
and then the plaque was at a lopsided angle. And okay. there was the, there was another one somewhere which was in memory of Barbara Devonish Phibbs, whose wish was to have a bench plaque inscribed with her last words. Unfortunately, her last words were, and then it's a series of expletives, the uh, <laughs> asterisk, asterisk cloud. That's really funny. Currently, scientists are trying to find out uh, who killed the dodo with a CT scanner. Whoa. There was yeah. more than one dodo, though. That's true. But yes. <laughs> no, that's true. What do you mean, that's... though? So do you mean like not a specific one or is it? A... I do mean a specific oh. one. There's a dodo in Oxford's Museum of Natural History. And uh, oh, yeah. it's it's a celebrity dodo, actually. Know, although yeah. these days all dodos are celebrities. But um, this is the one that Lewis Carroll may have seen when he was writing Alice in Wonderland. And it might have inspired the dodo in that. But scientists thought that it had been killed uh, some some way, or that it had died of natural causes. Actually, because they I thought, thought it had been they brought threw to the it UK. on a threw it on a bonfire or something. I Didn't thought they destroyed it? it. Yeah. Well, I they've thought... still got the skull. All right, okay. that's the main uh... thing. And so they they put the skull in a CT scanner, and they found it didn't die of natural causes. It was shot in the head with a shotgun. So that wow. is the opposite of natural causes. Um, wow. And what they're trying to do now, they've got a little bit of the lead that kind of impacted with the back of the skull, and they're trying to find out what country the lead from those shotgun pellets was mined in, and then they're going to try and find out where the shot was made from <laughs> that lead. And they basically, they're on the longest cold case ever, where they're trying to find out 400 years later who pulled the trigger. Wow. What, oh, gosh. That what are amazing. they going to do? So Imprison his great, 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 great grandchildren? Yeah, exactly. They're going to get a knock on their door. Where were you on, on the 4th of March, 1596? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I was just looking into the kind of quirks of Iceland, the country. Um, I didn't know this. Beer was banned there until 1989. Really? The, the, it was banned in 1915. They had a referendum and they decided to ban beer. And then in 1921, they had to change it a bit. They legalized wine because Spain threatened to stop buying Iceland's fish if Iceland kept on refusing to import Spanish wine. So they said, oh. okay, fine, we'll have some wine. And then they, they allowed very, very weak beer but they didn't allow normal strength beer. And this backfired badly because people just started putting vodka into their incredibly weak beer uh, and making a kind of horrible beer and vodka cocktail. Oh, some of that, some of the spirits that you get in Iceland are unbelievable. I went to, there's a restaurant that specialises in slightly sort of um, quirky food and I ordered the fermented chuck. Uh, and it comes in a jar, sealed, killed in a jar with a rubber thing and a very, very strong glass of... Well, we call it schnapps. I don't know what you call it. It's a very strong, um, pure alcohol thing. Uh, and uh, I said to the guy, I didn't order the schnapps. He said, you're going to need it. <laughs> 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 and you, because for the sake of the other diners, you have to open the jar really, really quickly and grab a little spoonful of this stuff and stick it in your mouth and close it because it smells so terrible. And the taste was the most disgusting thing I've ever had. It burned <laughs> the back of my throat. And I and I did take a, take the schnapps as a shot. Uh, I drank it so quickly. It, anything to make the taste of the really, fermented shark go away. I really it's thought awful. you were going to turn around and say, that the, the amazing thing is it smells awful, but the taste is no, divine. Disgusting. No, it smells awful <laughs> and also tastes awful. Horrendous. <laughs> um, hey, one bit of royal etiquette, which I think is um, upheld in the royal family as opposed to being upheld by the tabloid press, is eating <laughs> etiquette, which is that... And it doesn't... It makes sense. So the queen is served first. You would serve the queen first at a dinner. And then when she stops eating, really you're supposed to stop eating as well. And this has existed for a few hundred years. And it was really difficult with Queen Victoria because this was the practice then as well. But Queen Victoria, the thing about her was she was incredibly greedy. She used to eat <coughs> extremely fast. Like her advisors used to say, stop eating so fast. She got terrible indigestion. She could eat seven courses in half an hour, <laughs> apparently. And she was always served first. And so oh, the people no. who were served last, by the time they got their plates, they were sort of immediately whipped away from them again because Queen Victoria had inhaled oh, her first God. course. I've got to they say, must, Anna, yeah. we've been for dinner quite a lot of times and you will <laughs> not let a plate go if there's any food left on it, no matter <laughs> whose plate it was. Yeah, <laughs> Is this yeah. why you've never met the Queen? Because <laughs> I did it once and I've been banned from dining with the Queen since, desperately trying to lick everyone's plates as they were taken away. I had a quick look at some things that you could get sent to prison for in Finland. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. In 2015, the police asked the members of the public that if they saw a pizza that was on sale for under six euros to inform the police. 
But the way that they saw it is it's impossible to run a business where you sell pizzas for less than six euros. It's just the ingredients okay. are too much. It's completely impossible. So if people are doing that, it means that they can't be paying the tax on the pizza, oh. which means that they must be tax av- avoiders. Uh, and so they asked, literally asked people to said, as soon if you see any pizza on sale for underneath that price, send us the menu and we'll arrest the guys. Oh That's God. so funny. That is a bargain price for a whole pizza. Mm. Yeah, it is. Really. Unless it you're is. in a shop. In a shop, it's a kind of normal price for a shop pizza. <laughs> that, that's a very, very posh shop pizza, really, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, I mean, there are yeah. pizzas around the corner that you can take away delicious for a fiver, and I'm now wondering if it's my responsibility to be informing on them. <laughs> Just is, is... tell the police in Finland, because obviously the taxes in Finland are a bit higher than they are in the UK, so... Probably right, it's course. more of a seven pound thing in the UK. Oh, maybe. you feel bad if you got the whole staff and structure of the co-op <laughs> sent to Finnish prison. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are you in for? I'm also in for selling this pizza. <laughs> There's the pizza wing, isn't there? <laughs> the hardened criminals. I went on eBay um, oh, yeah. to look at what the most expensive items currently on eBay are that you can buy that are related to Lincoln. Did you find? The horse hair. Yes, that's so good. So yeah, there's a lock you, you of hair. Us. There's a lock of hair from uh, the horse you rode in the 1860 election called Old Bob. And um, <laughs> Old Bob attended his funeral. And for just $1,250, you can buy a hair of this horse. Wow. One hair? Yep. Actually, one yeah. Actually, it's not a lock, it's one hair. A single one hair. hair. Yeah. You wouldn't, like, if you open the envelope, that could just fall onto the carpet and you've lost it. If you're a mafioso and you don't have the resources to put a whole horse's <laughs> head on someone's pillow. I'm just, just thinking that, you know, as a middle-aged man who's losing his hair, it shouldn't, I shouldn't be letting it go down the drain. I should be saving this in case I become president or like the president's horse or something in the future. I don't know. Surely this is our next tour match. <laughs> Parkinson. <Yeah. laughs> Um, I've got just one last thing about sort of ingenious ways of catching poachers, people who are trying to illegally catch all of these fish. Um, During the early 80s to about 1998, there was a guy who worked for the California US Fish and Wildlife Service. And his name was Terry Gross. And he was sort of sick of the fact that there were poachers that would go in the early morning to catch all this salmon when that was highly illegal. So you usually had to stop half an hour after sunset and they would drive out at two or three in the morning and they would get away with it because the tracks that were leading to all of these lakes were monitored by other poachers. So if they saw a truck come down that they knew was one of the wardens, they would say quickly, get the boat in, get out of there. So they had plenty of warning. So he had no idea what to do. But then he came up with this idea of putting on a wetsuit, getting into the water before the day ended and waiting patiently And what he would do is, while they were fishing salmon, he would loosen the glove of his wetsuit, and as they were fishing, it would hook onto his glove, and he would slowly splash around, and they would start going, oh my god, I've caught a massive salmon, and he would go harder and harder, and they're like, this is the biggest salmon we've ever got, they've got this on recording, these words, and they would slowly come in, and they would get to him, and as they got right up to him, he would say, good morning, gentlemen, state fish and game warden, you're under arrest. Wow. And he would pull out, he would pull out of his wetsuit, a citation book, and he would give them their fines. And then he would go back in and try and catch more people. And Ira Glass, uh, NPR, and This American Life, um, looked into it and they found that there were plenty of these people that used to do this, sit there for hours and get caught by it's the fishermen. Amazing. Yeah. Wait, but did they so did they have their heads underwater while they were waggling their glove above the water? No, because it was so dark. So they would they would Fine, sort of okay. yeah, sit above and yeah, but that just in genius. a nice little spot. It's brilliant. This guy's an amazing guy. That's real commitment to the job. <laughs> I don't know if I'd sit in freezing cold water for a full day in a pond just to catch a poacher. I what? had a neighbor once, an elderly neighbor who would sleep in his car to try and catch car thieves. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, he, and he caught them. <laughs> Did he actually? Right. Yeah. Waggling keys out of the window <laughs> as soon as someone grabs them. I was just thinking, Dan, that this guy who's pretending to be a fish, basically he's lucky that they're not catching them with dynamite, isn't he? Yeah. Because yeah. that does or not car work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, in the, the <laughs> in the example in this interview, they heard somebody going, get the net, get the net. And then another voice goes, get the net. Heck, get the gun. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, 
So one more thing about uh, Olympians who have other jobs. You know the Bryan brothers, the oh, the tennis the tennis guys, the tennis Bryans. Yes. Yeah, we absolutely love the Bryan brothers. <laughs> uh, so it's sort of best doubles partnership ever of all time. They've won a billion Olympic medals, and they have a second. I don't know if I can call it a job. So I don't know how much profit they make from it, but they also are a band. They have the Bryan brothers band, okay. right. and so Bob plays the keyboard, and Mike is on uh, the guitar or drums, but he's not on the drums when the drummer of the Counting Crows joins them which he does sometimes so like legit band and i mention it because everyone has to look up the 2009 song autograph which i'd forgotten about <laughs> but is it features cameos from andy murray and novak Djokovic. Wow. and <laughs> i'm telling you i i wish to god it was this andy murray here because that would have been less awkward <laughs> than what they make andy murray the tennis player do it's it's about what a horrible druid is signing autographs after matches and oh, andy no. murray's little rap section in the middle oh, uh, includes the lyrics during Wimbledon, it gets really crazy. My hand cramps up and my mind gets hazy. And um, look, I'm going to leave people to imagine the rest. But. Andy Murray's rap <laughs> section is never the words that should never, ever be put together. <laughs> <laughs> Another fun thing about ghost crabs is that they're very house proud, but only when they are sexually mature, which maybe is the same for humans. So when males are not sexually mature, and if you get female house crabs, they burrow into the sand and they leave these tiny little holes in the sand that are smaller than a tiny coin, but they can go four or five feet down, which I always think is kind of cool. Anyway, they burrow holes into the sand and they just throw the sand anywhere. The sand that they've used to burrow, they just chuck it all over the beach. But as soon as they hit sexual maturity, they suddenly sculpt the sand into a perfect pyramid. And this is to sort of advertise themselves to ladies, we think. So a woman can look across a beach and she'll spot the sexually wow. mature men by the perfect pyramids that are next to their entrances. And you'll see <laughs> you'll see the little entrance and then it's little crabby footsteps, footprints going to the pyramid. Do you think that if a ghost crab goes to Egypt, they look over and they go, fucking hell, <laughs> there is a very attractive, enormous <laughs> ghost crab yeah. over there. <laughs> yeah. Very intimidating trip. Very intimidating stag do for those males. <laughs> so you can find out a lot of things from CT scans of mummies. Um, they tried to, they CT scanned an Egyptian priest called Nas Yamun, uh, and they scanned his throat and his vocal cords, and they could find out what his voice was like. So they did the <laughs> CT scan of his um, vocal cords. They created a 3D printed vocal tract, and then they kind of fired air down it, and they could work out exactly what he sounded like. Um, and it's basically people on the internet think he sounded a bit like Britney Spears. Cool. <laughs> oh, I thought I, I thought the, I'd heard audio. this one. I thought he just went. He, he goes like <laughs> meh, like that meh, oh. and you know oh, how cool. she goes meh meh meh. Yeah, no, James, that's your, that's your cat you're thinking of. Oh, that's yeah, not, sorry. That's not pretty space. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, there was basically um, they, the sound did the rounds on social media and a lot of Britney Spears fans were very excited about it. Wow. <laughs> like un <laughs> unreleased material from 2,000 yeah. years ago. Well, yeah. the interesting thing is, like, Ness Yamun would have, he was a priest, so he would have done a lot of singing and chanting in the temples. So basically, if you went back to ancient Egypt and you walked past a temple, it would sound like some one singing baby one more time wow he wouldn't have been dressed as a schoolgirl though it seems implausible <laughs> might have been there's probably a lot less chess players online than we actually think there are because they create fake accounts and they build them up and up to be sort of well played chess players with high rankings and then they play themselves and defeat that person. So it's yeah. sort of creating bogus accounts in order to defeat them <laughs> so and then good. raise your ranking. Mm, Imagine um, if it's just one guy, the whole of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you heard of sandbagging? That's another cheating thing. No. So you weird, this one, yeah. yeah. This is where you play deliberately badly to qualify for a tournament that is actually a bit beneath you. Oh, yeah. And then you win. You take the breaks off and you... you thump everybody that's that happens in golf as well people claim um like you you play badly for ages until your handicap gets way worse and then eventually you go right today's the day that i'm going to try and win the tournament <laughs> it's extremely looked down upon I think. yeah yeah, yeah. No, no well, they've, shit. they've got measures in place don't they to, i think they have actual measures in place now on the chess side to stop that so i think it's really? if you ever yeah i think it's if you ever achieved certain high scores 
they look at it and go, well, there's no way that you can now suck that much uh. because you got to this level. And if you if you won a certain amount of cash prize, like a high cash prize, well, how did you get to that? You must be good. You must be sandbagging us in order to mm. to do that. So very embarrassing if you're not sandbagging and you are just having a really bad <laughs> exactly. <of nuts>. <laughs> <laughs> or if you just you got get... lucky one time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It happened. I think they had to change the rules or tighten them a few years ago because there was a middle school. It's so sad when you're sort of forcing 12 year olds to do this. But in Texas, it's called Henderson Middle School. And they entered a competition where you had to have a ranking under 900. And then they absolutely smashed it. They were investigated and it turned out they'd lost all of their previous 28 matches um, and they're really good. And someone worked out the chances of them having lost them all being as good as they were. And it was one in sextillion chance <laughs> that they could have lost all 28, which is like if there'd been them playing chess since the start of the universe and everywhere in the universe, it still wouldn't have happened probably. Wow. So they were disqualified. So but 12 year olds, come on. I, okay, I think it's not impossible that some people get to a really good position on chess.com because they're only playing people who are deliberately losing in order to <laughs> sandbag. So they think they're incredible. They win a big cash prize and then the next time they play it, their deficiencies are revealed and oh. then they get banned from playing because chess.com thinks they were the ones doing it. It's an absolute oh, minefield. God. Vicious cycle. <laughs> um, other people who go down um, sort of scavenging and, and hunting around the, the lost rivers are the... Ty it's Tyburn? Is that the pr pronunciation? The, is it the, the Tyburn Angling Society? Yes, the Tyburn Angling Society. <laughs> uh, it's just wonderful. They, they meet up once a year to report on the fish they found. Uh, it's always zero. Uh, so it's not the greatest <laughs> angling society. But they are obsessed with the idea of daylighting, which is the idea of bringing these hidden rivers back to the surface through destruction of the stuff on top, uh, of bringing the Tyburn back to being what it once gloriously was. And it's an extraordinary thing that they put together in around 2000, where they put a full report to show how they would do it, where it would go. It would demolish about one billion pounds worth of real estate, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Turling, it's only Buckingham Palace that needs to go, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's Buckingham Palace, that's part of their plan. <laughs> they want to get rid of it. Um, I have one more thing about Houdini's habits at home. When Houdini and his wife had an argument, he would leave, he'd walk around the block, and then he'd come back and he would open the door of the room where his wife was and throw his hat into the room, right? If it was thrown out again, she was still angry. And I guess he would do it again. <laughs> and if the hat remained in the room, she, she had calmed down and what they would if, go in and resolve it. What if the argument was about him leaving his clothes hanging around the house all the time. <laughs> like a lot of the arguments in my house are about. <laughs> so I read a paper called uh, Man and Mongooses in Indian Culture uh, by Derek O. Lodrick. Uh, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce his name, but um, I'll look it up afterwards. Uh, and I found the oldest known story about mongooses, and it's from 3,000 years ago. There's a king who's having a feast, and then a mongoose walks in, and half of his body is made out of gold. And he comes in and he rolls in all the food of the feast. And the king's like, what the hell are you doing? And he said, oh, well, I once rolled in the food of a Brahmin, uh, like a really holy uh, Hindu guy. Uh, and the Brahmin was so holy that he turned, when he rolled in his food, he turned half into gold. And this mongoose is going around looking for another holy person so he can turn his whole body into gold. Right. I don't know if you want your whole body turned into gold. I'm pretty sure King Midas taught us that, didn't he? Yeah. Maybe yeah. they hadn't come across each other. King Midas I mean, didn't turn into gold, did he? Yeah. No, oh, no, no. He turned no, everything but... he touched into gold. He didn't have, like get a gold finger and then no, but what he, but he regressed touch his it leg and it... he had a gold leg. I know he regressed it because he couldn't eat But wait a minute, anymore. what happened? No, no, he, he regressed it because he couldn't, well, partly because you, if you touched another person who he loved, they turned into gold. And that's based on the fact that people don't want to be turned into gold. Yeah. What that's happened if, if King Midas touched himself? Do we know in... Is it in the story or? They didn't do that in those days, James. It was a cleaner time. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was something about Finland that was in actually the original article I read. And it's about, um, it's an amazing fact that I didn't know. And I can't remember how the journalist Lewis segued into it. But I'm just going to segue into it by saying she also mentioned that Finland's only monarch, the only monarch it's ever had, is this German guy who never visited Finland. That's all right. Yeah. And they, this is in 1917, they got independence from Russia. 
And they started off thinking we want a king. Uh, everyone else has got, or a queen. Um, everyone else has got one. Where should we find one? We obviously don't have a royal family here in Finland because we're brand new. And so they picked this guy, uh, Frederick Charles of Hesse, and he was a German prince. They designed a crown for him, which I think you can still wow. see it's on display somewhere in Finland. And then before he even had a chance to enter the country, they changed their mind uh, after a few months <laughs> and he abdicated. Oh. <laughs> That's it. That's Did he abdicate from thing. overseas? As in he, yeah, yeah. yeah. he was yeah, out, yeah, still yeah. outside. God, that's so it must funny. have been good yeah. in those days when there were all those new countries being formed. And if you were if you were a minor noble in anywhere in Europe, whenever there was a new country, you must have been there with your fingers crossed, <laughs> yeah. thinking, "Oh, maybe I'm going to be king of that." You're sitting maybe in the maybe. waiting room with all the other <laughs> potential monarchs going in for their interviews. <laughs> <King>. <laughs> Hope that bastard from Schleswig Holstein doesn't get it. He's coming out looking all cocky. <laughs> really ace the practical, the waving section of the interview. <laughs> Here's one quick thing on forgeries. Um, there is a forger, or there was a forger, called Elmir de Hori. He was a Hungarian um, in the United States, and he did forgeries of loads of people, Picasso, Matisse, and he did loads of forgeries of Medigliani. Okay, and he did so many Medigliani that these days it's impossible to compile a catalogue of Medigliani's work because we don't know what is real and what is a forgery by this guy, Dahori. <laughs> and the reason I bring it up is because he has a collection of all of his forgeries, and it's run by a guy called Mark Forgy. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. He's got extremely fast internet as well, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Have you guys come across Freddy and Truce Overstegen? No. Who were... They not were today. Part... Not, not, he's not hit at the hotel here. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were part of the Dutch resistance, in fact, and they were 14 and 16 years old, respectively, and wow. they were killers. Cold-blooded killers, and they called their kills liquidations, uh, which oh. is kind of terrifying. And apparently the 14-year-old actually looked about 12, so it was quite easy for them to get away with killing because no one expected to be killed by a 12-year-old girl. And the way no. they did it was they had various methods, but they cycled around quite a lot. I guess cycling was a thing for these resistance ladies, and yeah. they would ambush uh, collaborators. So they'd be on two bikes, and they'd have pistols in their bike baskets, and they'd ambush them. Or sometimes they'd do a drive-by, so Freddie would be riding the bike and Truss would be on the back and, you know, cycle past some collaborators and just shoot them up as oh you ride by. Oh, God. Wow. Off into the sunset. Wow. And what was the liquidation bit? Or was that just a fancy... They would just shoot them as opposed... There was no melting they didn't, them down. No, no. <laughs> they didn't have, like, a vat of acid in their cellar where they dragged Nazi bodies. Cool. No, just no. get back. What, you didn't melt them down? <laughs> no, we just, we just did a drive-by and shot them. Well, you you, you got to melt them down, mate. <laughs> Maybe they did. I guess them. I didn't look into it enough. There are a few sort of modern loopholes for companies in Britain that don't have a liquor license. And I was reading about one place which was there was a new craft distillery in Yorkshire that was being set up in a disused train station. So they'd done it up and it was for um, it was going to be for gin, I believe. And it's called Tapling and Megan Distilleries. And by the time they were about to launch, all the paperwork hadn't been done yet for their license. But they had this big party that they wanted to promote uh, their drinks. So what they had to do was they looked and found a loophole, which is if you're on a moving train you don't need a liquor license. So all trains that you buy alcohol on, they don't need a license. A moving train is exempt from it. And the fact that they were in a train station and they had a parked train there, they got all the guests onto the train and they took it on a two and a half hour ride uh, just to one, they just went one way, turned around, well, not even turned around, just drove back again <laughs> and did a uh, two and a half hour gin masterclass once it was in motion. And that that allowed them the loophole of of having nice. the party still. If you had a bar yeah. which had a miniature train on the counter, so it sort of came choo-chooing along mm. with your drink, does that count? As then you wouldn't need a liquor license. Maybe you have to I be think... on the train. So if you went to like, what's that um, What's that sushi place which has got the conveyor yeah, yo belt? Sushi. If you go to right. Yo Sushi and you sit on the conveyor belt, <laughs> technically you don't need a license. <laughs> don't sit on one of the coloured plates. You will be selected. <laughs> Um, I was looking at other ways that museums need to preserve their artifacts. And one is from fires, serious problem. And mm. it's a really difficult choice for museums because the main way to get rid of fires is with sprinkler systems. But obviously, if you sprinkle a whole art gallery 
then you sort of ruin the paintings that mm. way. But so a lot of museums kind of don't do it. And that was a serious problem in Brazil. You might remember a couple of years ago when the main museum in Brazil destroyed 90% of its collection uh, because of a fire and they just didn't have the adequate protection. But there is one place, the Getty Museum in LA, which has such cool fireproof systems. So they have like they had the big wildfires last year and they were pretty much licking at the sides of the museum and the curators were completely chilled out about it because it's so well protected. So it's full of like Rembrandts and Manets, but they, first of all, they have a system where the oxygen can get sucked out of the rooms so that as soon as a fire got in there, it wouldn't be able to breathe. And so it would just immediately go out. So it's like an anti-ventilation system. Cool. And then they also have around the museum, a million gallon water tank. And so as soon as a fire starts coming <laughs> close, they just start releasing water into the wow. ground all around Ooh. the museum, like a moat. It's great. And so firefighters who are fighting the wildfires use the museum as like a rest area and a vantage point to look around at the rest of L.A. and go, ah, well, I guess I guess the art's OK. Wow. But really clever. <laughs> That's, really cool. That's amazing. That is really clever. Uh, well, just speaking of water, um, there is a museum in Spain, which is the Museum of Underwater Archaeology, which is called Aqua. Uh, and they've had a real problem with leaks this year. <laughs> Um, they've, these, now hang on honestly they get all of their stuff is stuff that's been found underwater like statues which are sunk or with um shipwrecks or anything that's come from the bottom of the ocean uh, and they have hundreds of thousands of things in there uh, but they also have uh leaks in the basement and a lot of damp <laughs> causing problems with the wall and they're really worried about it and they reckon that it's going to wreck all of the things which have been underwater for thousands hundreds oh, of years no <laughs> Um, have you guys heard of uh, at Nuclear Trains, a Twitter account? No. no. This is a really cool one. So it's a Twitter bot, um, and it's made by two scientists who are called Matt Allenson and Keir Little. And what it does is it tracks trains which are carrying nuclear waste across the UK. Oh, so these trains clever. go. You I didn't know, there's know they set... existed, actually. Is that... <clears throat> Sorry. I didn't know um, there were trains that had... Uh, well, voice. right. You, you, <laughs> there's, it's there's not... not. They're yet to tweet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, well, yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not common knowledge, but they sort of. They ha you have to transport radioactive containers, and trains are not a bad way of doing it. They're very tightly sealed, um, and these guys. They're not pro or anti-nuclear. They they genuinely are just in it for the trains, as they say, um, and they have clarified that the radiation you would get because sometimes these pass along platforms you know they, they go through brixton or whatever quite mm -hmm. near passengers but they've said that the radiation you would get if you were on the platform and one of these trains went by will be like you'd just eaten one banana isn't that amazing oh, that everyone on the platform yeah. has just eaten the equivalent of one banana but would you feel it would you feel full you don't than you were? <laughs> <laughs> everyone slips over on the platform yeah <laughs> no they don't emit bananas um <laughs> they just get that much radiation. That's yeah, exactly. Really yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. But that's quite dangerous because if you're such a banana lover that you're constantly operating on the banana eating cusp of getting radiation poisoning <laughs> and you manage it very carefully, you know, you're eating 350 bananas a day and that's you know true. 351 would tip you over the edge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That you're right. You. Yeah. What happens then, Andy, if a train full of bananas passes by? What is the radiation level in that at that speed? That that kills you immediately. <laughs> <laughs> they you... have to transport bananas one by one, don't they? That's why they're so expensive once they get to the shops. Do you know that this is one of my favourite totally random facts? But, you know, Penny Mordant, mm. who was defend very briefly actually Defence Secretary last year. Yeah. And before that was Did... International Development Secretary. Yeah. You know, she's named after a Royal Navy frigate. <laughs> wow. <laughs> really? She's named after HMS Penelope. That's so funny. Isn't that weird? <laughs> That's a really good A giant point. frigate. It's because she's from an army family. And actually, it was known as HMS Pepperpot because it was shelled so many, so many uh -huh. times in World War II. So she could easily be Pepperpot modern. <laughs> wow. Didn't would... she do that diving Which show? Is that Iron Man? Wife? Pepper Potts is Iron Man's girlfriend. Yes, that's yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why they didn't go with Pepper Potts. They didn't want her to be confused. <laughs> what? Why is she called Pepper Potts? It's a weird name. It's because she comes from a comic book, like all these characters, and they often, <laughs> oh, yeah. they often have quite punny names. And illiterate names, don't they? Yeah, good point. <laughs> 
I read about one um, plane crash or, um, you know, emergency landing in 2013, this guy called John Pedersen. And he realized that his plane had had a little bit of damage and he wasn't going to make it all the way to the nearest airports. This was in around Chicago. And so he saw a long road and he thought, well, you know, that's probably the best way to go. I'm going to try and stop on this road. But obviously there's traffic on this road, so he doesn't want to hit any. And what he managed to do was exactly time it so that when the lights went red and everyone stopped, that's when he landed in the middle of this intersection. Wow. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> wow. That's his wow. story and he's sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reading this article about it in the Chicago newspaper and they said that he landed and didn't hit anyone and he was in the middle of this intersection. And then the lights changed and two cars just went and didn't notice him and crashed into him <laughs> what <laughs> and then just apparently it says and then mysteriously sped off so they oh. <laughs> they kind of drove hit this plane and then thought oh shit i've just hit a plane and they just did a hit and run on this uh, left the scene of the accident <laughs> So oh, weird. I can't be bothered to fill the form in on this one. <laughs> yeah, no one's going to believe that, are they? <laughs> no, I'm never going to get this sort of claim. <laughs> <laughs> this plane just pulled out in front of me. <laughs> uh, yeah. People always think that pneumatic technology is going to be <clears throat> the next big thing. I think there was a, a lot of excitement in the US about 40 years ago that it was going to be how we all disposed of our rubbish. And so Disneyland, yeah. I think, was a pioneer of this, right? Mm. So their entire garbage disposal system is fully pneumatic. So if you're in Disneyland, wow. you put something in a bin and then it drops yeah. down into a tunnel system and every 20 minutes it just gets sucked oh about 60 God. miles an hour to a collection point. There are a lot of theme park nerds who are about to get angry at you because it's the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World in Florida, not Disneyland. Uh, I thank guarantee you. you're going to yeah. get Thank you for that correction. That. I... I I got to do a behind-the-scenes tour there once, so I actually got to see some of the, the tunnels uh, that those go through. And you're just kind of walking through the backstage tunnels, and there's just this tube next to you where every 20 minutes or so, you just hear this... Hang on, so do you, do you have to sort of goes... dive out the way every 20 minutes? <laughs> no, it? no, it's, it's, just, it's just a tube on a wall. <laughs> like, so how... It's not like a transparent How thing. big is the tube? Can you fit a human in it? It's 20 inches diameter, I think. <laughs> can, you fit, so... can you fit a mouse in it? <laughs> I mean, 20 inches okay so yeah. that's like, pretty big yeah i reckon yeah i i've been to disneyland and disney world as well and the rides i don't really like them as much i prefer <laughs> the universal ones the rides but if there was a garbage shoot i think then i would be definitely going for you that. could sell t-shirts saying why don't you get sucked off at disneyland <laughs> hey oh, like the rubbish through our pneumatic tube uh, system. I will, I, I will argue with you for like half an hour that Universal's rides are terrible compared to Disney's, but we do not have the time for that. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of Jebediah Buxton? Uh, my fav- no, I don't think so. My favourite plaque, plaquey um, okay. in the UK. Uh, lived in Derbyshire. The label is Mental Calculator. So Jebediah Buxton lived in the early 18th century. Um, I th- we think he was an autistic savant, mm. you know, people who could do unbelievable calculations in their head. So Jebediah Buxton was once asked after a church sermon, what did you think of the sermon? And he said, oh, I just counted how many words there were in it. And he just gave a word count. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> I know. I like he was self he was completely self-taught, not formally trained at all, and didn't know much about anything except numbers, but knew everything about numbers. So he walked around the local area, which is called Elmton, which is about a thousand acres, and he could give its size not only in acres, but also in square inches. Wow. He was amazing. That Sorry, cool. I have no idea what you just said because I was trying to count the number of words you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> Not it's as easy difficult. as it sounds, is it? It really isn't. It yeah. really is not. <laughs> uh, if you get a seal and you blindfold it and you give it a pair of earmuffs, then it can't find fish. Oh. Um, I'm not surprised. Yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised at all. Actually, <laughs> sorry, I've misread this. They can find fish oh. if you blindfold them and give them earmuffs. Okay, sorry. that's gone from being an incredibly <laughs> underwhelming fact <laughs> to being quite interesting. <laughs> and it's because they use their whiskers, right? And the whiskers oh. can tell the movements in the water. And this is amazing. So when fish um, swim, we talked before that they have like lots of eddies and uh, vortices and stuff like that, which they leave in the water. The seal's whiskers can detect these tiny little vortices in a fish that swam past 30 seconds ago. So it swam past wow. 30 seconds ago and it can still wow. feel where it was and then it can still follow the tra- uh, 
the track of the fish to get that, even if it's wearing earmuffs. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Can it tell sort of the time that's passed ra rather yeah. than up to 30? Like, can they be like, oh, 15 seconds ahead because they can tell the strength of the... Wait, they can't tell the future. <laughs> Not the future. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is they could count up to 30, but when they feel it, let's say it's a wake that comes past yeah. them at yeah, yeah. 15 seconds after it's been there. Can they know it's 15 seconds? I don't know if they can count up to 30. Yeah, I don't know if I they know it's exactly claim. 30, but I think they, they will have a, a basic idea of time and will know that, yeah. the, and know that the vortices will be stronger if it has gone more recently past. I mean, yeah, it's like yes. smelling something, you know, you feel it getting stronger as you get closer, don't you? Yeah, you don't, when you're mm. trying to find something in your house where the smell's coming from, you're not counting the, you know, your nose isn't saying that's exactly five meters away, but you can tell yeah. that really? it's closer <laughs> or further. You guys don't do that? <laughs> <laughs> I think if you want to sue anyone, you should sue the makers of Sherlock Holmes Baffled. Have you guys seen that movie? No. It's no. From, oh, yes. Yeah. It's from 1900. It's the first ever movie with Sherlock Holmes in it and it's an American silent film and basically it's very much against the canon of Sherlock Holmes because what happens is people keep kind of stealing things from under his nose and then using trick photography they just disappear and then you just get a picture of Sherlock Holmes going oh what happened there why did they disappear <laughs> and then they reappear in another part of the room and then they steal something else and then disappear again and it goes on like that for a couple of minutes and I just don't think that that's really I mean no. first of all he doesn't mm. solve anything he just stands no, there looking he's confused baffled. yeah he's, he's baffled. baffled yeah well that was made in 1900 I believe mm. right is that right mm, James right. so there's another one which I'd love to see 1916 the mystery of the leaping fish and this was a movie where Sherlock Holmes was sort of lampooned by Douglas Fairbanks, Douglas Fairbanks uh, Jr., who was one of Hollywood's leading actors at the time. He was a swashbuckling adventurer, and he, along with Charlie Chaplin, they set, it up, they set up UA, United Artists, and he was a huge influence in Hollywood back in the day. And he played basically the druggy version of Sherlock Holmes, really right. bringing up that side of his character. So... The way that in the movie he was presented, he wasn't called Sherlock Holmes. He was called Coke Any Day, E N N Y D A Y as his surname. And he had a bandolier of syringes that he wore across his chest. So he was constantly injecting himself as the movie went this along with amazing. cocaine. Yeah. Um, he had a clock with the clock face that says eats, drinks, sleeps, and dope instead of the numbers. So he would know when to inject himself. And um, the idea is that Coke Any Days was trying to find all of these drug barons, and once he caught them, he would sample all the drugs that they had <laughs> as he was busting them. And Fairbanks hated the movie after it came out. It was only a two-reeler, and um, he just said, this is horrific. But that's one of the earliest Sherlock Holmes movies as wow. well. Amazing. <laughs> Did you say 1916? 1916, yeah. yeah. Wow. Houses. But that, Dan, that was the first year as the first full-length Sherlock Holmes film, but this was a bit more serious because he was um, because it, 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 it wasn't a mad cocaine rob. It was um, he was played by William Gillette, who was a distant cousin of the Gillette really? Razor family. Pink yeah, Camp Gillette, really? exactly. Yeah, um, and uh, William Gillette was a really interesting guy. So he only played Sherlock Holmes in one movie, but. Um, that was after he'd played him on stage about 1,300 times. He'd come up with a stage version of it. And, yeah, and he and Arthur Conan Doyle were actually friends. Um, they, I, th I mean, Arthur Conan Doyle was probably pleased because he managed to work out a way of doing the character well on stage and it was, you know, respectful and all mm. of this, but also entertaining. And when they met, I really like this, William Gillette, um, they were meeting, I think, on the same train. And uh, Gillette got off the train dressed as Holmes and then he found Arthur Conan Doyle and he examined him through a magnifying glass. <laughs> and that was, from that point onwards, they were firm friends. Really? <laughs> he, Conan Doyle loved it. Yeah. That's a, it's a risky move, isn't it? Because yeah, it really might, is, yeah. Yeah, he might think you were taking the piss a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but we also, amazing, we had um, temperance bars in Britain which were super popular around the end of the 19th century, again, with this big push to stop people drinking. And apparently for every little mill town, there would be at least three temperance bars, which is essentially like a, I mean... A cafe. What is it, like a milk bar? <laughs> like a, it's a cafe. Yeah. It's a cafe, I think there might... St there used to be not 
not that long ago, there was definitely one in Lancashire. I know that much. Well, there's one left now, and uh, it's Fitzpatrick's in Lancashire. You're absolutely right. And the owner of the Fitzpatrick's in 2012, he'd just been on Hairy Bikers, actually, and talking about the great stuff about non-alcoholic drinks, like Dandelion Burdock and how great abstinence is and how popular the bar still was. Mm. And then he was done for drink driving. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Have you guys heard of the nuclear bomb that was dropped on the Greggs? What? <laughs> so, no, but I can understand that. Okay. <laughs> Greggs the so, Beggars. Greggs the... Well, no, I've tricked you with my words. <laughs> this is the story of the only nuclear bomb that has ever been dropped on American soil by an American plane. Okay. And it fell on a family who were called the Greggs. Um, they lived in South Carolina. Parents, three kids, uh, their cousin. Everyone was playing the kids were playing in the in the yard next door to the garden right perfectly normal afternoon high above them in the sky there's a plane which is doing a training exercise with a real nuclear bomb where they have to transport it across the country um so training exercise there had been some kind of mess up with getting it sort of locked into its um its sort of um hanger thing you know it's hanging there above the bombay doors um so the captain sends a crew member to adjust the the locking mechanism the crew member uh can't quite get a handle these are huge bombs it looks like a you know it looks like a whale it weighs about three tons the crew member climbs slightly up the side of the bomb and reaches up to grab something to get a handhold unfortunately what he grabs is the emergency bomb release mechanism right oh. well, does, the bomb and fall- then does he fly down on it like in dr strange love or- so the exact well the bomb no. falls onto the bomb bay doors right which crumple like paper yeah. the crew member makes an x shape with his body and just about stays inside the plane <laughs> okay <Whoa. laughs> the bomb is now falling towards the completely unaware greg family house it lands <laughs> in their garden it makes a crater 15 meters across and 10 meters deep the fam- no one is killed. The family are all injured, but they, they you know... They became they superheroes. They no. They become superheroes. <laughs> um, the family's chickens, unfortunately, were oh, vaporised. But no. the bo- thank God the bomb did not go fully nuclear. It kind of had the safety catch on. But then, amazingly, they stayed... The, the crew were so apologetic. They were so <laughs> mortified they'd done this. And they wrote yeah, to the shit. family apologising, and they stayed in touch for years with... The crew, this family, the Greggs, really? even to the extent that one of them visited the family for a week's holiday many years later. <laughs> wow, no way. That's incredible! That's so nice. That's incredible. That must How have been long... an embarrassing moment because I used to get embarrassed enough, you know, when you had to knock on your neighbour's door and say, "I'm really sorry, I've kicked my football into your garden." <laughs> yeah. I am so sorry. I have dropped my nuclear bomb in your back garden. <laughs> um, in the Vietnam War, I don't think we've ever mentioned Operation Wandering Soul, have we? Mm -hmm. which was one of the tactics that the US used against Vietnamese soldiers, which was to play ghost noises incredibly loudly out of helicopters and from US soldiers sort of hidden in Vietnam. They'd have these big boom boxes and play ghost noises. That doesn't seem like it would work because helicopters are extremely loud. And it's not like you're going to... They're not like they can sneak up on you and then (laughs) play this noise. You're going to be... First thing is you hear the helicopter. And you're going to yeah. go, why are ghosts driving helicopters now? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> you're so right. The idea was that in Vietnam, the belief is that if you don't get a proper burial, then your soul wanders the earth. And so they actually recorded South Vietnamese people. They recruited South Vietnamese people to record themselves shrieking and screaming and saying, my friends, I've come back to let you know that I am dead. I'm dead. Don't end up like me. Go home quickly. Wow. Really? Crazy. And the Vietnamese soldiers mainly didn't believe them, no. and all it did was give them a target to return fire to. <laughs> so, oh no, <laughs> that would still scare me. I have to say, if if the four of us were out, you know, in a in a jungle, and we were scared, and a boombox had a voice of say Alex Bell saying, "Oh, don't come over <laughs> here, I'm dead," I, I'd get scared by that. What situ- Why are we in the jungle, Dan? I mean, what, how badly wrong has our tour gone? <laughs> that we're. <laughs> We're on foot in Vietnamese jungle. And why does, does, Alex predict- Bell? Yeah, and why does it take a boombox and a helicopter and the jungle for you to pay any attention to Alex Bell? <laughs> <laughs> Alex, if you're listening, here's how you get us to actually upload the podcast correctly. <laughs> When you say there, there are all these museums around Iceland, some of them do sound, I would say, of limited interest. So yeah. there's a museum, there's an island called Jaime, Jaime, um, 
and there's a collector on there who's collection museum whatever you like it's a lifetime of paper napkins which are organized by theme into binders <laughs> and there's a photo of her online her sofa is covered in binders <laughs> full of paper napkins I, I just does anybody else feel an overwhelming sense of sadness just, just, <laughs> <laughs> well there's napkins there to wipe your tears away so yeah that's so true Good place to have a cry and they have a museum of sea monsters but the way that they've done that is they have the stories of sea monsters um like any museum might do but the founders they phoned every single care home in iceland and they asked for all of the elderly residents, do you know any stories about sea monsters that have happened in your history or have you heard any stories? And they collected all of those and they're all the stories that are in the museum, which I think is a really good way of finding social so history, isn't it? Yeah, so wonderful. Cool. But oh, that's I the origin that. of um, of Grimm's fairy tales in the first place, isn't it? The Grimm brothers didn't write them. They went around and collected them. Did uh, they from, really? Uh, mostly from women, yeah. Oh. There was a woman, I think she was called Daughter Wilder, who who uh, uh, p- p- gave lots of the stories, but they went around and uh, particularly older women asked them for the stories that they remembered. Mm. I mean, really, we ought to be doing more of that. I think mm. that that kind of um, gathering of stories is a wonderful thing. So good for them. That's great. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. It sounds like an incredible um, filing system, but done as an entire country, where they're mm. all dedicated to filing mm. <laughs> one aspect of social history. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just, yeah, it's incredible. With the Grimm brothers, I read a story, which I really hope is true. I, I always keep meaning to look it up, which is when they were gathering the stories, one of the brothers was trying to get a great story off um, a sailor or some guy who who, um, who knew a bunch. And uh, he said, what can I give you to give me your story? And the sailor needed new trousers. So the Grim brother gr- gave his trousers on the spot to this guy to wear and then gave him his story. And he took it down sort of, you know, trouserless as he was... <laughs> As he was taking it, just love. I love that kind of. I need your story. What do you need? My trousers, fine. Go for it. Um, <laughs> did the, wait? Did the guy? Did the guy he was talking to not have any trousers on? No, he was probably he a, just. Was he approaching a trouserless man and saying, <laughs> "Tell me your story"? As in, I think a trouserless was... sailor. There's another story there. <laughs> yeah. Wait, was it the story of Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> um, actually, in Berlin, there was a traffic jam this year that was in the news, which hmm. was this is in February. And this was created by one German artist, or <clears throat> calls himself an artist, called Simon Weckert, who created a traffic jam by just pulling a handcart. So he was on foot and pulling a handcart behind him, carrying 99 phones. So how Google Maps works is when it's giving you traffic updates, it assesses all the number of phones in a certain area and then assumes that those are lots of people in cars and then assumes that that means there's a huge traffic jam. Mm. So Google assumed massive traffic jam on this one bridge and it redirected traffic around it. And this guy was just him on his own walking through the centre of Berlin. He actually walked past Google's offices just to do a sort of... (laughs) Middle finger that must up have to been them, so I guess. Freaky for the guys at Google. They must say, oh my god, yeah. the traffic jam. It's coming this way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's an invisible one. They're the worst. That's yeah. hilarious. They they claim to be supportive. Google a Google spokesperson said, whether via car or cart or camel, we love seeing creative uses of Google Maps as it helps mm. us make our work better. Oh yeah. Doesn't that sound like they enough. really and now, liked and it. And now that yeah. guy has been killed. <laughs> He's yeah. been disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> Won't find him on Google Maps anymore. Um, one thing that's quite similar, which is uh, about modern technology and slightly hacking it, is the old Teslas, um, which would drive, you could t- set them to drive just underneath the speed limit wherever you were. Um, they would read the traffic signs. And so researchers at McAfee realized that if you got a 35 mile per hour traffic sign and you got some black sticky tape and turned the three into an eight, then your Tesla would drive at 85 miles an hour in that area. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Isn't that amazing? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, these are the old Teslas and the new ones don't do that anymore. Um, mm. I think possibly thanks to this <laughs> little bit of um, work by McAfee, but. It just, I mean, especially as the 35 mile an hour traffic signs are usually in places that need people to slow down. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's and that's so that's why we're still in the trialing stage, really, of the driverless <laughs> yeah. cars, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like one smear but, on a speed sign and everyone dies. <laughs> Have we ever talked about just that? Reminds me of the Tree of Tenere, which is in um, or was in I think Liberia, but somewhere up there. And um, it was the most isolated tree in the world. And there was no tree anywhere for like, I don't know, 
a hundred miles in any direction, and then it got yeah. knocked over by a Libyan truck driver. Oh. <laughs> it was just oh, like, dear literally, there's nothing else to... And he just decided, I'm just going to drive straight into that by accident. That must have been like the scene in Austin Powers where the guy's being about to be run over by the steamroller, and he's shouting, no, from about 20 metres away very, very slowly. Do you think the, guy, the truck driver was similarly... I, don't know I can't that. see I don't anything know else. I think that's a really unfair analogy because in Austin Powers, the idiot is the person who's about to be run over. So that implies you're blaming the tree and yeah. the tree's gone to extreme <laughs> lengths to escape traffic collisions. It's so socially distanced, that tree. It but really is. I think what it is, is there's something about people when they're driving. If there's a massive area with nothing there at all, but there's one thing, then mm. for some reason you just kind of get drawn towards it. Like your brain just can't avoid it there there is a thing called target fixation isn't there where, where someone is so focused on avoiding a thing that they keep looking at the thing and aiming towards it accidentally the conversational equivalent is that thing which is in the meaning of lift where there's something you're trying to avoid talking about and so you can never avoid talking about it and i think the example that's given in that book is if you're talking to someone with one leg and you find your conversation is liberally peppered with references to long john silver or <laughs> the last leg of the uefa competition it reminds me of um Michael Windsor, who is now Basil Brush's PA. Jenny, you're he, always uh, you're always name dropping. Because you're friends uh, with Basil Brush, aren't you? That's why I you am friends him up. with Basil Brush. So the way he got the job was he rang up Basil Brush's creator's son as Basil Brush and auditioned oh. for him during the he just oh, just wow. was in character the whole time, did oh the voice God. perfectly, got his mannerisms, and he got the job. Wow. From that phone call, which is an absolutely bold move because yeah. you've got the potential to really upset somebody who literally this guy sees Basil Bush as his brother. That's how um that's how Peter Sellers as well got his first job. Peter Sellers of Inspector Clouseau fame and the Goon Show and so on. He was getting nowhere and he was an impressionist and he called up the BBC and he did an impression of the the head of the BBC at the time saying to the person who's the producer picking up going have you got this peter sellers not in an american accent. <laughs> where's, where's peter sellers where's this peter <laughs> sellers guy hey this kid's hot i hear you gotta get him you gotta get him now um so yeah so he imitated it and the guy went oh i'm, I'm so sorry well yeah we'll book him and peter sellers later admitted that was actually me but the guy was so impressed that's um, hilarious that's impressed. actually how rory bremner still keeps getting jobs <laughs> he can do a very good impression of the director general of the bbc <laughs> That's not fair. Rory Brown is great. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Do you know Vanilla Ice's real name? Oh, I feel like I should. Um, oh, gosh, I can't remember. It's He's called it? Rob, Rob Van Winkle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. right. Yeah. Anyway, apparently... Why on was... earth would you change that? I, know. I mean, that's a fantastic name. And it also, is. wait a minute, it scans perfectly, doesn't it? Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> he wouldn't have to do Ice Ice Baby. He's got... You're absolutely right. Yeah. He was called Vanilla because he was the only one in his friendship group who was white. Uh, and he got called that. Mm. And then he had a dance move called The Ice. Mm. Yeah. Right. I didn't, I didn't know he was white. I didn't know anything about him. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> he yeah. almost played London, I think, in 2019 or 20... Possibly, yeah, 2018 or 2019 on Ice. It's going to be his first Vanilla Ice on Ice no. concert. Yeah. Well, and he sings a song where the lyrics are Ice, Ice, Baby. This guy has an obsession. <laughs> He's got a problem. Yeah. It's an He's issue. <laughs> Actually, um, like Crowley has something in common with Rex Lambert, uh, founding editor of BBC's List of the Magazine. Is it that they were both insane? Uh, I suppose so. Actually, you'll get sued for that. And this is about being sued as well. So um, Alistair Crowley tried to sue a writer called Nina Hamnett for libel because she called him a black magician. Um, she said he was into black magic. And he said that this wasn't true. And he tried to sue her and he lost and he was declared bankrupt. And then towards the end, basically, he became a big drug addict because he'd taken a lot of drugs before and then he became a real drug addict uh, and he died quite young. Um, but I was reading about Nina Hamnett and the, according to Wikipedia, she was a Welsh artist and writer who was an expert on sailor's shanties and became known as the Queen of Bohemia. 
She sounds incredible, Ooh, really? doesn't she? Yeah. Um, she was basically um, like one of the main people in Soho around the 1930s who kind of knew absolutely everyone. Um, she had an incredible bohemian life. But actually, when she sued Crowley, it became such big news that it really kind of wrecked her life. And she became a bit of a alcoholic, just walking around taverns in Fitzrovia, trading anecdotes for drinks. Sad. Mm. Yeah. If you take on black magic... It yeah. always wins. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was amazed about other people's connections to the occult around this time and people who I thought were just legit humans. So the way Crowley first got into this whole world was I think he joined an order which is called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Mm. And another leading figure in that was Yeats, mm. which as in WB mm. Yeats. And he was actually, him and his partner, Maud Gon, famously his sort of muse. And also E.E. E. Nesbitt, who wrote The Samyad, if anyone's read that um e. anyway Nesbitt, Yates... like five children and it e. yeah Nesbitt. exactly wow it sort of makes sense when you think about it you can imagine someone who was into weirdo magic writing that yeah but yates was a chapter leader for this order and crowley didn't like him and there was this big rivalry going on about who should be ruling this chapel crowley or yates and eventually crowley invaded his chapel mid-sermon he launched what he called an astral siege on wow. the chapel, which involved um, kicking the doors down. And he was wearing a kilt for some reason and an Osiris mask, because inspired by Egyptian Ooh. mythology. And he started casting spells and waving daggers around, and the police had to come and break it up. Wow. And well, they, yeah, the, they fell out. The big story of that, it's called the Battle of Blythe Road. And the story is that he came through and he started propelling black magic at Yates and the others as he was coming up the stairs. Yates was using white magic and the white <laughs> magic toppled him over down the stairs. Now, that's what they say. But when you read into it, what it actually was is he was coming up the stairs and Yates and his buddy, who was a boxer, was kicking him <laughs> back down the stairs. Is that what white magic down. is? White yeah. magic is yeah. some <laughs> big guy kicking you down the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. He's one of the um, gladiators. This is white magic. <laughs> but this this order, the idea was they wanted to discover a unified theory that explained the magical world so that they could bring p endless possibilities to magicians. That was why they were set up. And that's why Yates joined. He wanted to use it for good. Um, and so he joined Crowley and he had a mentor there. And the name of his mentor, Alan Bennett. Wow. Yeah. How cool. I mean, it's not actual Alan Bennett, obviously. I was summoning a demon yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it would go. Um, this year has had an exciting new naval battle, which is great because, you know, not as many classic naval great? encounters as that. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's Sorry, funny. I don't want to get old Jeremy Corbyn on your ass, but. <laughs> <laughs> I promise this is a good one okay. because this is the first naval battle in the Caribbean for 75 years. Um, and it's between uh, Venezuela, a uh, Venezuelan naval patrol vessel, okay. which was doing the rounds, um, defending the motherland and so on. And it had guns, anti-aircraft guns, the machine guns mounted on the deck, lots of stuff. On the other side was a Portuguese cruise ship, uh, which included an 80-seat theatre, a sauna and a jacuzzi. Okay? <laughs> the, the Venezuelan patrol vessels it said, you're being very territorially aggressive or something. They, the, basically, they were chancing around a bit. They approached, they ordered it to come into port uh, in Venezuela and, you know, surrender and all of this. They then opened fire and then they rammed the ship. Okay, they rammed the cruise ship. But unfortunately, they didn't realise that the cruise ship in question, the Resolute, was built for polar cruising and it had a one metre thick hull. <laughs> the Venezuelan naval patrol vessel crumpled, basically, like oh, a tin can. No. 44 sailors had to be rescued. Unbelievably <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> Wow! Yeah, <laughs> that must have that must have really livened up that cruise ship cruise <laughs> for the people on board. And, and if you look out on your left, you'll see the Venezuelan <laughs> navy. And Venezuela is now owned by Thomas Cook. Is that right? That's, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you know that there's a lot of art that just sits out at sea on private yachts that often are worth sort of two to three times the value of the yacht itself. They're such valuable pieces of art. So for example, um, Joe Lewis has a 200 million pound super yacht. He is the majority stakeholder of Tottenham Hotspurs, the football club. He is he's a very he's a billionaire in the UK. And um, he has a yacht and that moored. And when it moored, people could see through the window and they saw hanging inside one of the rooms a Francis Bacon painting that sold anonymously at Christie's for 26 million pounds. And so there's courses you can take now to train people for the practical care of onboard art collection. 
because everyone on board doesn't know how to look after these you know so sort of priceless pieces of art and they keep getting damaged when they're out at sea and you know someone will pour um someone will uh, pop a champagne bottle and a cork might oh, no. hit a priceless piece of art or in some cases there was one guy uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat who's an artist who has little bits of cornflakes that are hanging off the paintings and they were very worried that they were going to be ripped <laughs> off thinking that maybe the kids on board had spilt their cornflakes onto the painting <laughs> itself <laughs> Um, you, so can't, you, sort of... you can't spill cornflakes <laughs> onto a painting that's, that's hanging what... vertically on a wall. I don't know. That's Dad, the... Dad, you've got kids. How <laughs> how far does the food fly when it gets spilled? I, I, exactly. You very much can. You absolutely can. <laughs> well, that and... uh, ceiling fresco at the Vatican is just <laughs> full of cocoa pops, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think if you're putting cereal on your paintings, then you shouldn't have an automatic right that it's taken seriously. <laughs> yeah, well, appa- apparently in this case, it was a mistake. He was eating cornflakes looking at his painting as no. it was laying on the floor, and it fell on it, and it became part of the art, is, is what they say in this article. But then one of the more famous ones is that um, some millionaire or billionaire owners came back onto their yacht, and they'd been told by that the captain had unwrapped a piece of art that had arrived for them onto the yacht, and had hung the painting on the wall. And this was a horrific moment to hear it because the piece of art that they'd unwrapped was a bit of art done by Christo and Jean-Claude. And their way of doing art is they wrap things up. So they just wrap stuff up. (laughs) (laughs) And so effectively, the captain had taken the actual art off put it into oh, no. a room with all the hot pipes and then hung up this painting on the wall. <laughs> and you might know some of their work. They did the, the Reichstag in Berlin. Yeah, they they wrapped that. the entire... Yeah, 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 that's yeah. what they do. They just go around wrapping things. So yeah, so there's <laughs> courses now for teaching you how to look after art on the high seas. Very good. So funny. God. A bit after that, there was a famous dog. He was called Don the Talking Dog. Uh, and he was called the canine phenom- phenomenon of the century. Uh, he debuted in 1912, and he had a vocabulary that reached eight words. Mm, um, wow. What words were they? Well, uh, please don't say rough and rude. <laughs> Back. I think it was a bit like that. They were all in German, first of all. Um, he uh, could say interesting. he could say haben. He could say kuchen. He could which means cake, and the first one means have. Uh, he mm-hmm. could say he could kind of say ja and nine. And he could say Ruha. Oh, come on. I need a I need a recording of this or I will not believe. <laughs> well, he was really saying he was yeah? absolutely massive. He was like he was when he came over to America. So he was big in Germany, obviously, like you're going to be big in Germany if you speak German. But when he came yeah. over to America, there was a lot of kind of German expats there uh, and they were really excited. And so they met him on the coming off the ship, a load of reporters and asked him for a quote, which um his owner said he was too seasick to give a quote uh, when he arrived, but he was very impressed by New York. Uh, but whenever he went on stage, he would kind of um, answer a series of questions. Um, presumably the answers were always Harbin or Kuchen or something like that. Uh, but the point was that he would make noises that sound a bit like it, but according to... Um, the journal Science, someone did an actual paper on it. They said that really he's only just making noises and it's the people in the audience that are interpreting it as words. They sound a bit right, like words, yeah. but obviously he doesn't really know what he's doing. And it helps that the German language sounds quite a lot more like a it dog really barking does. than sort of the <laughs> Spanish language. I mean, you wouldn't get away with a big romantic language and a dog trying to impersonate that. You're absolutely right. When I don't understand a question or I can't quite... Um, determine what the person said. I give an answer that is uh, indeterminate as well. So it could be uh, sort of a mixture of yes and no, or or I'm not sure. So, you know, because I don't know what the person said, but I still want to respond because they're staring at me. So I'll often say something like, (laughs) I'm, hey, hello. And and they they go, you sure? And I'll go, "Uh uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> and so that's just a little hint there for some people. You might want to, it's a little little skill you can have. That's Do a sort of a halfway noise. In Russian, you can say yes, no, yes, no, which means no. Danyat means no. Right. As, well, in New Zealand, we, no. have, we have a term <laughs> called oh, yeah, nah. Oh, yeah. You've probably heard of this one. No, that's right. Yeah. 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 So when people say, you going to the beach? Oh, yeah, nah. And you, they, <laughs> what does that they, mean? Does that mean yes or no? Well, it means you might, but you just see how you go. Oh, okay. Uh, and they might say to you, oh, are you into it? Have you seen this thing? Are you into it? Oh, yeah, nah. You know, you could be, but you don't want to give it away 
Mm. So it's it's a wonderful <laughs> response because, and then you can't you can't actually respond again to that uh, by law in New Zealand. So if you've received an oh yeah nah, you can't go look. Which is it? Because then you're just you're shunned. I suppose you could All just right. you could just say maybe. I guess it's a similar word. No, because then you're really giving it away that you're not sure. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, it's not an right. unsure. Oh, thing. yeah, it's... nah, is, is, is the full spectrum. Okay. Very non-committal country. An entire country that's terrified of commitment. <laughs> is, <laughs> that's actually, that's actually an option. Was. That's actually an option on the upcoming election ballot, isn't it? Oh, yeah, nah. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yes, no, or oh, yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> now, even though it ends on nah, this, the, the year part has got to be strong. Oh, yeah, nah. Oh, really? That's the way you say it. Well, just, yeah, there's different ways of saying it. So but I would also, have assumed it meant no in the end. The one you end on seems to be the dominant ask one. Me, ask me whether it does. Oh, does it just mean no? No. Uh, right, <laughs> great. <laughs> Should we get back to talking dogs? <laughs> um, the breath actually can be a problem in some places, like the um, Edvard Munch Museum in Norway. Um, they say that the scream is fading. The scream, which is his most famous work, is fading because of people's breath. And that's because he used very cheap, low-quality paint. He used cadmium sulfide paint, Monk, when he did his painting. Uh, and it means that when you breathe on it, it kind of gets worse and worse and worse. And they're trying to stop people from breathing in that museum. They should, they should replace it with the screen? Yeah. Yeah. The scre- scream in front, in front of the, of the screen. screen. Yeah. yeah. Very okay. nice. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it was too good that I didn't laugh. <laughs> One of those ones. I was afraid to breathe in front of it in case <laughs> in case the joke faded too far. Yeah, well. <laughs> Should we um We can stop there actually. We Should we can it? it? Yeah, let's do that. That was a great one. No, no, it's fine. I was only gonna talk about um taser tampons. We could let's talk uh, about taser tampons <laughs> quickly yeah, and then and quickly, we can we move should, on after yeah. that. I refuse yeah. to press stop. <laughs> so some modern uh, self-defense gadgets, obviously it's still a, a bit of a growth area, even though a lot of these things get released and they're not legal to carry. So you, mm. there is um, a killer engagement ring with a particularly sharp cut diamond, um, an unbreakable umbrella, which whacks just as strong as a steel pipe, but weighs only one pound and 11 ounces. Whoa. But I think my favorite is the pink stinger which is a stun gun made to look like a tampon. It can deliver a 50,000 volt shock and can be used handheld or shot out to distances up to 14 feet. So no. that's, that's, that's wow. a heck of a tampon. I think I've wow. seen that done in Thailand, actually. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Dear me, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but you don't wear it as a tampon before you fire it. At your it's not no, a ping pong no, no. Ball it's, thing. It's, no. It's to be hidden within your handbag within and your nobody handbag. would know. Not presumably among your other tampons. Yeah. You don't, uh, get yeah, the wrong, yeah, you don't you want to accidentally get the wrong one, up. do you? Yeah. <laughs> Although, if you've got enemies and they ask for a tampon in the bathroom, that's a hell of a prank. <laughs> prank. <laughs> 50,000 volt prank. Prank goes wrong. Man doesn't understand what a prank is. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Lovely. Wow, that's extraordinary. Those are all on the market. We can, we can get yeah, them. Yeah, they're, they're available somewhere, and I cannot guarantee that they are legal in the, <laughs> uh, in the territory in which you're currently listening. So please don't waste your money. I got one last thing, which is I, I like the idea of the name Center for North Dakota. So I just quickly looked into other names of North Dakota to see if there's any fun names. And I found there's a place called Flasher, which is great in North nice. Dakota place called Zap. Uh, and Zap kind of the only major thing I could find that happened there was in 1969, there was a movement called Zip to Zap, where the mayor of Zap suddenly found two to 3000 partiers tearing up the streets and setting bonfires in the middle of them uh, to have this big party. Uh, and they had to get the National Guard in to push them out. Why was that called Zip to Zap? I, don't I thought you were going to say the is. mayor zip wired into Zap, which sounded really fun. <laughs> No, I think it was just a group of people that let's zip over to Zap and have a massive party, is uh, the, uh, I believe. And then lastly, a place called Buttsville, which is a cool name. Wow. B-U-T-T-Z-V-I-L-L. Ooh, Z- of, oh, that is weird. There's a lot of butts in, um, in that part of the world, isn't there? Because um, butts like, means a, it's like a raised bit of land or something so there's is that, that b-u-t-t-e yeah so in yeah. montana and wyoming and dakotas there's loads of butts 
you're not going to believe this. In South Dakota, there is a place which was the original centre of North America, <laughs> which was done by drawing two lines, and it is called Snake Butt. Really? Oh. Yeah, and they put an obelisk on it, uh, and they named it the approximate centre of North America. And um, then in 1930, they changed their minds and decided it was in Rugby, North Dakota. But it was Snake Butt. A confusing name, because it's actually really hard to work out where a snake's butt is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Do you know what? I was, um, I was having a look, so I was going looking through some old books, and uh, I, I, maybe this is just me having sort of lockdown brain, but I suddenly uh, had a look at Winnie the Pooh, and I hadn't realised quite how philosophical it is. So there's a wonderful bit where Piglet and Pooh are sitting underneath a big tree, and Piglet says, what if this big tree falls down? And Pooh says, what if it doesn't? And I just thought, mm. that's a great attitude to life, isn't it? Instead yeah. of catastrophizing and thinking, what if this terrible thing happens? I like that attitude. I mean, or am I being ridiculous and reading no, too no, much right. into no. it? I have to you... say, it sounds like Pooh is praying for an end to the pain there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he's taken Piglet there on the assumption the tree will fall on them both. <laughs> no, but I really like that. Why are we always worrying about the bad thing that's going to happen? What if? Yeah. What if? doesn't yeah. and we just sit here happily and not worry about bad things happening to us <laughs>